Bowie seems suddenly so old, his skin yellowed and wrinkled, sagging and loose under his chin. He seems so physically fragile. But besides any tragedy, there's also this self-deprecating humor, the cute little show tune song and dance step when he sings by the time I got to New York, and the comedy of this jerkily shot body writing hunched Kafka-like over, like a Kafka character hunched over an old-fashioned writing desk with a Yorick skull on the side. What is he writing? A long suicide note, a shopping list, thank you notes for his birthday presents on January the 8th. It's not clear. Although Bowie seems to be addressing us directly from beyond the grave, just like that bluebird, oh, I'll be free. He's also, this is an important point, as you will know, he's still ventriloquizing. He's working indirectly. He's still speaking in character to the end. For example, Bowie sings, I was looking for your ass. I hate to break it to you, but I doubt that David was looking for your or anybody else's ass in the final months and weeks. He's speaking through the persona of Lazarus. The clue here is the repeated line, ain't that just like me? Sure, it's just like Bowie, but it's still not Bowie in some pure essence. The strategy of his art is always, and until the very end, oblique. He just can't give everything away. But why Lazarus? Why that theme? The question began to perplex me. It wasn't just the name of his final video, but also the name of a piece of musical theater that opened on December the 7th, 2015 at the New, Th New York Theater Workshop that Bowie co-wrote with Ender Walsh, directed by Eva Van Hover. The show features that the song Lazarus. It's called Lazarus, sung by Michael C. Hall, who's a formidable Bowie imitator throughout. I had the good fortune to see the show twice once in premiere and wanted to talk back with the music director, Henry Hay. Talk back was always a depressing experience, you know. Uh, what are you saying? <laughs> Speak up. We can't hear you. What's the point? <laughs> the narrative of the show Lazarus is a continuation of the story of The Man Who Fell to Earth, based on Walter Tevis's 1963 novel, The Man Who Fell to Earth. Nicholas Roeg's 76 movie av adaptation of Tevis's book ends with Bowie as the alien, Thomas Jerome Newton being in New York with a rather serious drinking problem. You know how it is. Newton hasn't aged and cannot die. Hasn't aged and cannot die. The show Lazarus picks up at the end of the film, showing Newton in his New York apartment drinking copious amounts of gin, eating Twinkie bars, and obsessively watching television. But why is the show called Lazarus? Why is it not called The Man Who Fell to Earth 2? <laughs> For his fans, the identification of Bowie with Newton was always total. Still shots from Bowie's, uh, from Roeg's The Man Who Fell to Earth were used as covers on Station to Station and Low. Roeg had originally conceived of casting Bowie uh, as Newton after seeing Alan Yentob's 1975 BBC Two documentary, Cracked Actor, where Bowie plays himself, whatever that means. What's so odd is the fact that Bowie in his last year should take such an interest in the Newton character as to want to reenact and extend the story. This time, however, Bowie fills the story with his own music, which permits an even greater identification of Bowie with Newton. You remember that uh, Bowie, the compositions that Bowie wrote for the soundtrack weren't used by Nicholas Roeg, and they wound up, one story is they wound up on side two of Low. There are 15 tracks, Bowie tracks, in the show, and one of them is Lazarus, the other, th other three that haven't been released yet. And of course, particularly in the light of his death, we're going to read anything that Bowie did in his final years as allegory, an autobiographical allegory especially when given such a series of clues as we find in Lazarus. But Bowie is occupying the persona of Newton, mobilizing it as a vehicle for a number of constant themes in his music. Aging, big theme for Bowie, grief, isolation, loss of love, horror of the world, and media-induced psychosis. 
Newton is at once Bowie and not Bowie. And it's through this act of distancing that we're permitted the deepest intimacy. It's what Bowie always did. But why is the show called Lazarus? Why is the song called Lazarus? Why did he choose the track with that name as his last video, his final public appearance, his way of saying goodbye? And that point we need, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, to return to the Bible. In John's Gospel, Lazarus is the figure whom Jesus raises from the dead after four days in a stony tomb. At some personal risk because of the hatred of the local Pharisees. I could try and do this. <clears throat> Come out from my isolation. The hatred of the local Pharisees. Move over here. Um, Jesus returns to Judea to the village of Bethany, which is now reputed to be the best, the West Bank, the best bank town. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> the West Bank town of Al Azaria. Oh, the ironies of history. He does, not, he does this out of love for Lazarus. Jesus, I can't see anything now. But particularly because of the kindness and faith that was shown to Lazarus by Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary. Martha and Mary poured perfume on Jesus and washed his feet with their hair. Imagine that. You know, you'd go back, wouldn't you? <laughs> they, washed, they washed my feet with their hair, Jesus says, and oh, I'm going back. <laughs> their brother's dead. They seem very nice. This is the key moment in the narrative and theology of the New Testament. This is when Jesus declares that, I, Jesus is very posh, I am, I am the resurrection and the life. The one who believes in me will live, even though they die, and whoever lives by believing in me will never die. When Jesus sees Mary's grief at the death of her brother, John's Gospel says, Jesus wept. John was Scottish, obviously. <laughs> now, a little known fact, Mary, Martha, and Jesus go to Lazarus' tomb, and Jesus commands that the stone laid across the entrance be hauled aside. Jesus says. He's very good at giving orders. Martha says, by this time, she's from the country, by this time there's a bad odor, for he's been there for four days. It's Martha. She's from Basingstoke. But, but Jesus is messianically undeterred, and he says to her, Jesus says to her, did I not tell you... German at this point. Did I not tell you that if you believe, you will see the glory of God? John's Gospel continues. The dead man came out. Oh, it's in Scottish. Yeah. Dead, dead man came out. His hands and feet wrapped with strips of linen and a cloth across his eyes. A cloth across his eyes. Good as a joke. You one person got the you got the joke. <laughs> Rest of you've got to raise your game. You're useless. <laughs> Returning to Bowie, what is so striking is the cloth around Lazarus's eyes, which is how Bowie depicted himself in both Black Star and Lazarus. The cloth across the eyes. Lazarus is the figure who's been down to the realms of the dead and is brought back to life wrapped in a funeral shroud, his eyes covered. In the video of Lazarus, Bowie is shown levitating from his bed, being raised up and resurrected, while a demonic young female figure cowers underneath. In the biblical scene, Lazarus doesn't speak. This is a strange thing if you go back to the, the Bible, as I'm sure you do regularly. Um, Jesus, uh, Lazarus doesn't say anything. Uh, and the scene concludes with Jesus' final words. Take off the grave clothes and let him go. Lazarus doesn't say, hey, I'm alive again. Thank you, Mr. Messiah. Lazarus doesn't say that. He doesn't burst into grateful tears or betray any emotion. He just reappears and is allowed to go. 
Nobody asks Lazarus if he actually wanted to come back from the grave. And he does not seem particularly happy to be back with his sisters. <laughs> Maybe he was happier being dead. Interestingly, this theme is picked up and explored by Nick Cave in a track called Dig, Lazarus Dig from 2008, which also takes place in New York City. And Cave sings of Lazarus, I mean he, I can't do this in Australian accent, I mean he, he never asked, because my Australian accent ends up like a South African accent. He never asked to be raised, you know, he never asked to be raised, in the, I mean he, no one actually asked him to forsake his dreams. After his resurrection, Lazarus, or Larry, as Nick Cave nicely puts it, behaves in an increasingly neurotic and obscene way. Nick Cave says he ended up like so many of them do back on the streets of New York City in a soup queue, a dope fiend, a slave, then a prison, then the madhouse, then the grave. Ah, poor Larry. But what do we really know of the dead and who actually cares? Maybe Lazarus isn't so much the story of a heroic resurrection that proves Jesus' messianic credentials, but a sad tale of someone being pulled back to life without really wanting it at all. But with Lazarus is not so much the story of a return to life as the acknowledgement of the inability to die while being gripped by grief over lost love. And that's what's going on in the, in the Newton play, Newton Lazarus. So what might Bo be telling us with the figure of Lazarus? That he is poor Larry? To be honest, I just don't know. But what do we know of the dead, really? The biblical Lazarus occupies a space between life and death, belonging at once to both realms and to neither. He's at once dead and not dead. If we think back to the character of Newton, then he's also obviously a Lazarus figure, unable to die, but unable to live because of the ghosts of the past and the lost love that haunts and tears at him. Is Bowie Lazarus? Is this why he chooses to use this final persona in order to say goodbye to us? And in choosing the character of Lazarus as the one who is unable to die, is Bowie even saying goodbye? That's the question. Is he even saying goodbye? Now I'm reminded here of Kafka's remarkable little story, The Hunter Gracchus. The hunter dies after falling from a precipice while chasing Shami or Shamwa in this native black forest. The boat of death then takes Gracchus on a long journey to the realms of the dead. But the pilot stupidly takes the wrong turn at a certain point, and Gracchus is condemned to spend the next 1,500 years pointlessly drifting from port to port, wearing a rotting Lazarus-like shroud. And Gracchus says, I have been glad to I've been glad to live and I was glad to die. Gracchus, Lazarus, and Newton are all figures who cannot die and cannot live. They occupy the space between the living and the dead, the realm of ghosts, of spectres, of purgatorial ghosts. Perhaps Bowie is telling us that he also occupies that space between life and death. And his art constantly moved between these two realms, these two worlds, while belonging fully to neither. Maybe that's what he was saying all along, in which case Bowie is dead and not dead. And perhaps he always was. I want to talk about my mother. Um, my mother, Sheila Patricia Pierce, became Critchley. It was with her that I first watched Bowie on Top of the Pops in 1972, and who bought me a copy of Starman. She introduced me to Bowie, and to be honest, it's one of the few things we really were able to talk about down through the not-so-golden years. My mother died on December the 5th, 2015, so two months ago. I don't want to go into details, uh, and people say all sorts of very stupid things about the pain of grief. 
My feeling in the days and weeks after she died was not just a feeling of aching pain and the inability to concentrate, let alone sleep, but the very clear and very sober sentiment that time had lost its flow. Time had just somehow stopped. It wouldn't budge or shift, and I felt caught in its nets. Of course, I thought of Bowie's words from Aladdin Sane, where time's script is you and me. He flexes like a whore. His trick is you and me. In the weeks after my mother died, I read as much about grief as my limited powers of concentration allowed. The only person that seemed to get it right was the English poet Denise Riley. I thank Johanna Oxala for this. When she writes a chronicle about the effects of the death of her son, it's not even, she says, that one feels immeasurably sad or that one is engaged in some sort of mourning process with a series of distinct steps. After my mother died, I felt a very clear, almost contemplative sentiment of time's reality, of simply being stuck in the moment and just hoping that it would pass. It was a state of contemplation that was not in my head. It was visceral, lodged in the body itself, somewhere between the diaphragm and the groin, it seemed. The, the present grinds to a halt. The past drags at your feet and won't let go. And what of the future? Riley notes that one cannot take an interest in writing without the some feeling of futurity. Stuck deep inside bereavement, it doesn't seem as if there is any future. As a consequence, I took no interest in writing as my mother died. I couldn't see the point. The weeks that followed were maybe the longest of my life. But, it was all, but I was also incapable of thinking about what had happened or speaking about it, save for a few trivialities and banalities. I was stuck, as many people are stuck, in kind of wordless, visceral paralysis. Then Bowie died. The morning of January the 11th, my inbox was full of offers to talk and write about his death. Initially repelled, I decided to throw myself into it. Although I can't say it's exactly been fun, it's like pulling teeth. I spent the week since Bowie's death writing and speaking to lots of people about Bowie. And uh, in some maybe slightly sick way, it's helped. Everyone was in grief and that kind of helped. Uh, Bowie's death unlocked my inability to talk about my mother and words began to tumble out and now I'm writing these words or speaking these words. By being about him, they were somehow about her. What can I say? It helped. Although I'm sure I didn't intend it, I'd like to thank David one last time for that extraordinary parting gift. But we have to let Bowie go to death and to life.